Good morning, everybody. Thanks to uh, NASA iTech for sponsoring this great event, to Canon USA for their wonderful hospitality, including that wonderful dinner last night, thank you, and to NIA for the hard work that it takes to put together an event like this. I'm Bill Brunner. I'm here to talk to you about a revolutionary new way to put together the advantages of the multi-copter, of the airplane, and uh, the speed of the rocket. I'm the co-founder, CEO of startup New Frontier Aerospace, a former NASA admi assistant administrator. I think I know some of you in the room. And before that, I was a fighter weapons instructor flying F-111 fighter bombers in the States and in Europe. Uh, so I've got a little bit of experience in precise on-time delivery <laughs> of packages. So next, next slide, please. So, each year in the United States, there are approximately 350,000 uh, heart attacks outside of hospitals. And it's only, the, those heart attacks have only a 10% survival rate. And it turns out that early intervention with CPR and automated external defibrillators can save uh, about uh, half of those folks, or a, actually the use of those techniques can double a victim's chance of survival. But at every minute that goes by, survival rates go down by 7 to 10 percent. So speed is life, we used to say in the fighter business. In this case, it's literally true. We believe, our models suggest, that a 200-pound rotor-recovered launch vehicle could get to a patient within seven and a half miles in one minute. It would take 20 minutes for, uh, that's 20 times faster than a typical multi multi-copter drone. The RLV would save lives by getting there faster. Competitors in, in this space are uh, Flirty, which uh, is pictured here at the bottom on the left, and they're flying a, uh, a trial right now in Las Vegas, Nevada. So drones are right now flying missions to save lives around the world. Not so much in the States because of our regulation, but that's being worked. Next slide, please. So when a standard drone can't get there fast enough, and can't carry the rain, can't carry the payload, it doesn't have the range, uh, RRLV adds a rocket boost and becomes the right answer. Next slide, please. So the majority of the cost for commercial aviation is fuel. Uh, you would think that a rocket would be a whole lot more expensive than a drone. Turns out it's not. That for the, a rocket of the size to do this mission uh, would take about $3.40 worth of liquid oxygen and jet A. Now, uh, let's say that I'm off by a factor of two. It's still $6.80 versus 99 cents for the drone, and we're still 20 times faster. Next slide, please. So, what is RRLV? I've been throwing this acronym around. Rotor Recovered Launch Vehicle. This is a flight from 1954, it's flown by a Marine pilot, Marine test pilot, a guy who. Uh, had a lot of guts because they didn't have simulators and modeling and simulation and all of the computer-aided flight controls. This is the first flight in history of a transition to horizontal flight from a tail takeoff. And uh, he flew uh, his hover tests uh, on a tether at, at Hangar 1 at NASA Ames. And I've seen video of that. It's, it's pretty scary. You're inside a building with a big Allison turboprop and hanging on the end of a string. So Skates uh, flies this mission, and then he comes back and transitions to vertical and lands on his tail. Landing on his tail, he's looking back over his shoulder to make sure, you know, to see how far he is from the ground. Uh, there's one test uh, engineer in the room. He knows how hard that is. Uh, so what this guy proved, though, over 60 years ago, is that this concept is feasible. Uh, he won the Collier Trophy for this flight, by the way, and deservedly so. So the advantages are short, no landing strip, uh, safe and practical recovery uh, in combat for DOD uses or in uh, urban areas for uh, 
commercial uses, at faster than a drone, less expensive than a helicopter, especially with a pilot. So it's feasible, especially with modern avionics and autonomous software. Next slide, please. So we build on the Navy's proven approach. We add a commodity level additively manufactured rocket engine from our partner, Additive Rocket Corporation in San Diego. And you wouldn't believe the price of this rocket engine. I, I, and I don't mean believe it on the high side. I, you wouldn't believe the price of this rocket engine. I hope the ARC guys uh, don't mind me giving away the fact that they, have a, they put together a really good product for not a lot of money. We also add the retractable rotor or propeller from sailplanes. So uh, sailplane guys and gals uh, uh, fly along on thermals and then when they want more power, they deploy the rotor and when they're done, they uh, retract it into the nose of the aircraft. This is a well understood technology. And if you add software to what Skeets did, we've got ourselves a product and we get there faster. Next please. But there's a problem with rockets. Generally, uh, throughout the history since Goddard invented them, 1926, we've had to chase them on parachutes, we ditch them in the ocean, we you know, add a lot of weight, wings, and gear, and maintain a big runway infrastructure, or you build a navy to fish them out of the ocean. Or you either you hire the real navy to get an aircraft carrier to go fish your capsule out of the ocean. We've, we've tried all that. Next, please. So, Recently, we've seen that precise retropropulsion is maybe a better way to do it, but there's a problem. It costs SpaceX literally a billion dollars to develop this technology. So what if you wanted to do this for somewhat less money? Next slide, please. We believe that a rocket that lands like a drone is the right answer. And the tagline is speed and acceleration of the rocket with a range of an airplane and the flexibility and reliability and safety of landing like the drone that you have in your backyard. Next slide, please. So sailplanes don't go supersonic. Well, most sailplanes don't, not without their wings ripping off. But so their solution for uh, folding rotors probably wouldn't work for a rocket. So we're engineering uh, with uh, Cal Poly, the great, uh, great engineers down there, uh, graduating from their senior class this year, uh, a folding rotor that is streamlined enough for supersonic uh, loads. Next slide, please. So RRLV, we believe, makes rocket-propelled semi-ballistic flight practical and safe. It can land anywhere a multi-copter can, no retro-propulsion close to the ground, no pillar of fire. Uh, you probably wouldn't want that in your backyard. It can scale to deliver anything we, a high-speed aircraft can deliver. When we flew, I, I never did this mission, but every once in a while, uh, the local medical folks would call uh, uh, an Air Force base and an F-111 would take a transplant organ across the country because time is life. We believe that ultimately when we scale that these vehicles can do the same kinds of missions. We've seen a practical example of a vehicle that's about 20 feet, three or, three or four meters long. We believe that this approach scales at least to that size, perhaps larger. We have not done the models, but we think that they're commercial science and military applications for, uh, for that full range of vehicles. So how does the money work? Next slide, please. Uh, we believe, we, studies show that there's going to be a $22 billion drone market here in the next few years. Uh, that's from Defense News a couple, uh, about a year ago. A in the same period, uh, there's going to be about a $200 million uh, suborbital flight services market. NASA's part of that. I've seen a couple calls. Uh, you pay for uh, near space and uh, Maston and uh, I think there's uh, uh, up aerospace to fly suborbital missions for you. We think there's room in that mission space for New Frontier. 
Uh, the unique, unique design of our vehicle allows us to compete in both markets. And so what we see is early on uh, that we, we would uh, get help getting onto the ramp, but as this, as this process ramps up, there's a lot of money to be made. Commercial, as well as defense and NASA. Next, please. So what makes us think we can do this? Uh, I used to fly jets, so I sort of know how airplanes and work, uh, and I've associated myself with some, uh, I think, some pretty smart folks um, who uh, have some experience in uh, flight and uh, engineering and software. So next slide, please. We're part of an ecosystem out in California, east of Silicon Valley. Uh, incubators at the, uh, at the uh, additive rocket folks in Southern California, Cal Poly, uh, as well as the Naval Postgraduate School, uh, who is interested in our help with putting up an ad hoc Wi-Fi network over the battle space. So three or four of these loitering over the battle, battle space, getting there quickly uh, to help special operators and uh, other military forces to do their job. So that's a, another application that we're uh, we're working with uh, Naval Postgraduate School on. And next slide, please. And uh, that's me before my hair migrated from the top of my head down to my chin. Uh, so used to work at NASA, have some government and space experience. Uh, my colleague Steve worked at NASA as well at Ames as a contractor in supercomputing. Mark uh, is the head of a, a nuclear um, a sensor detector uh, program and or company, I'm sorry, and uh, it's got Homeland Security applications. He said he'd be anxious to fly it on the RRLV once we scale up. Next slide, please. And this is the last slide. This is where I put the tin cup out. Uh, we believe about $100,000 in seed investment will get us to men viable product, and that's the vehicle that you see pictured over there by by the MVP block. We would begin construction, sell that, that airplane and a service contract to the first customer, and then out at about seven months, we would uh, start the flight tests, deliver it to the first customer, start tail number two, and then the ball's rolling, reducing the risk for the angels when they come on board at the end of the year. Last slide. This is the wrap-up. And uh, I am ready to take your questions, uh, and thank you for your attention. Is this mic up now, Dave? We got, okay, good. So we're going to pass the mic over to Ricardo for a couple questions. Hello, good morning. My name is Ricardo. Well, Hi. first of all, uh, uh, great job, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, can you give us a little bit more information about the stage of your product? You guys are still on beta right. at the UGA, right. and also what's the status of your company? Do you, right. you ready to raise money? Right. Which part of round you are? Right. Valuation, if you can share. I mean, whatever right. you can give us as a details of the company. Prototype stage, self-funded, uh, and we are going to build MVP whether we're funded or not. So uh, it's, we have not incorporated purposefully just to avoid taxes. Uh, so that's where we are. And I saw that you said that there's an addressable market of uh, several billion dollars by yes. 2020. Yes. Can you make money earlier than that? Or you gotta wait for 2020? No, 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 we can, we can make money with the first tail number. We, actually, we think we're, it, we're uh, in the black after the first year and selling three. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Miki Kwan Wolkowitz with uh, Duke University. Right. So my question is, um, can you clarify, do you think that the initial application um, of your uh, product will be in healthcare? You started talking about you know, heart attacks and right. being able to save lives, right. or do you think it will be more on the commercial side, deliveries, et cetera? So the value prop is speed. So that's why I started with the first responder market. Um, when you do the math for commercial, we would have to compete with a 99 cent flight for an Amazon drone. 
right? So, yeah, we're slight, we are a lot faster, slightly more expensive. You probably would not use this vehicle to drop a parcel for your Aunt jo um, Martha out in the country, right? You, you probably would take it to, to drop a defibrillator, though, or you might take a transplant organ 500 miles. So there's a range payload urgency Venn diagram that you've got to do. But we think there's a niche in there where there's enough money to make it worthwhile for, you know, I call both those markets commercial. On the military and the, and the government side, I think there are more urgent needs and we wouldn't have the regulatory piece. And so those two things I think are synergistic. We'll address both markets at the same time and uh, we'll see where we go. Sorry, I have one more question. Sure. Uh, so we don't want to, we make like devil advocate type of question just right, to right. stress. Yeah. So there's one word investor don't like, it's niche. Right. So uh, what do you think, I mean, I think this technology actually is great, can do a lot of things. Right. And, uh, but what do you think is your lower hanging fruit? I mean, what's your first use case? First use where, case. Uh, you know, how can you make the first $10 million right. with the first 20 clients, 10 clients, right. I don't know how much is going to be the ASP, but, right. you know, where are you going to shoot first? Yeah, your right. former uh, right. Uh, pilot, right? Um, right? What's your first target to so shoot? So my, my first target is DOD. I, the special operators have been out to look at, at uh, what we've got and have talked to uh, the Naval Postgraduate School. We believe there's an immediate market, immediate need for defense applications. Get there fast deliver your payload, whatever it is. And no, I'm not talking strike, I'm talking surveillance and reconnaissance. I think right behind that, there's the suborbital services contract. But I, at, th at the same time, that will help me to work the regulatory stuff. The, the government will, because it's in their interest, to get past that stuff, which will let me spin it out into the commercial sector, which I will work at the same time. I, I think it'll, there'll be a little bit more work to do on the regulatory side than there will be on the uh, uh, in, inside government. My question, my question touches upon um, storage facility and deployment of these vehicles. Right. So when you actually get to the stage where their your product is completed and you see right. these deployed, can you talk a bit about what the actual facilities would look like? Um, more for urban areas, dropping off. Um, actual medical devices, as you mentioned, right. or in the military space. So how many, right. how big the facility, and how that deployment works? Right. So for the MVP, which is about seven feet tall uh, and weighs a couple hundred pounds, uh, it's a warehouse type facility or a fly or a hangar. Uh, you wheel it out to the flight line, and you fuel it up with LOX and kerosene or Jet A, which is available at every airport, which is why we pick those propellants. And autonomous takeoff hub with the prop so that you don't have flames all over the place. And then you ignite at altitude for safety. Go do your mission. You deploy the rotor because you're not, again, the, the, the rocket engine's business is done. You drop your parcel. What the drones are doing is they're lowering them on a line and then dropping them off autonomously. We, we would do something similar to that. And then you would rotor back to your landing spot, airfield probably, to be put back in your warehouse or your hangar to go fly again. And for the demand, how many vehicles do you think you would need as a, as a base starter? So for military missions, a squadron is usually uh, 24 airplanes. So I imagine a special ops squadron of these things would be 24 airplanes. And uh, you would take them to the four deployed base, You'd operate them centrally. They'd go out and they do their missions and they'd fly back. A lot like the current day Global Hawk does its mission today. So, Bill, excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, I have. I'm going to start with three questions now. Sure. Uh, one about the technical challenges, two with the market projections, and three with the regulation challenges. Right. Let's start with the technical. Right. What do you think the largest technological risk you have? and how are you address it? Autonomy. I mean, I think that's actually, it's harder than the technical stuff. Most of the risk in rocketry, I know I'm speaking to a NASA audience, but for a 200 PSI chamber pressure or less, you know, we don't have the exquisite requirements of getting to orbit. 
So our mass fractions are 50% instead of 90%. Um, um, chamber pressures are very low. So we don't think there's a lot of risk in the rocket engine. We don't think there's a lot of risk in uh, the electric motor and the folding prop. There's some. The highest risk, I believe, is software for autonomy. Uh, you send it, you're sending these things out essentially at 500 miles an hour, um, hopefully over the suburbs and not really over Manhattan yet until they've got a few more decades of legacy or flight time on them. Um, or into combat, which is a you know, extremely dynamic environment. So that's a long answer to a short question. I think our risk is autonomy. That's a great answer. Um, but you're going to be launching this over populated areas, so there's going to be a huge risk there to the population. I, I, I think uh, we're used to rockets that like, ha are intended to go to, to Mach 25, so, they, so they're, they're built like dragsters. This is going to be built more like a, a Ford, right? Where the risks, I believe, you know, I, I could be proven wrong over time, will be relatively low, which is the new era of reusability is I think is going to cause us to have a paradigm shift in rocketry. Now, the guys who are trying to do that right now are flying to Mach 3 at Blue Origin and Mach 25 at SpaceX. But if you're flying to 500 miles an hour, I think we can take even less risks than they're taking. Okay, my concern is what regulation you, are you going to have to deal yeah, with? That's, to so we've thought about this. So is this a drone or is this a launch vehicle? Are we going to have to go to FAA, the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, or the, whatever office is going to end up regulating drones after the president's executive order uh, is fully implemented? Um, that's part of the reason why I talk about government first, because it will help us. They will help us. We'll operate off, off, out of government ranges, and then they will need to train outside of those ranges, and they will help us to get past that regulatory hurdle. So we'll work both of those things. And I do know something about working Washington. We will work both of those things to, so that uh, we, when we get a vehicle that's technically capable of doing its mission, that we can actually get past the regulatory burdens or hurdles. So the last sense. question. Yeah. You made a claim of a, a market capture in three years of 15 of the 22 billion. Right. How are you so, so confident? A million, million. Oh, there's a million? Our million, million. yeah, yeah. The capture was a million. The, Market size is a billion, so oh, okay. we, all I'm saying is we just want a little piece. You want 15 million of that's the 22 billion. billion. That's okay. right. I, I, that's the, right. The I apologize. Part, so it seemed pretty like a big capture. Right, right, right. All right. Okay. right. But I made the red circles big just for optical impact, right? Sorry about that. Yes, ma'am. Let me, let me just ask about the training. Uh, are yeah. you providing the services for this out of your company or will you provide training to the users? Yes, so part of the revenue stream early on will be we'll do a service contract with every vehicle we deliver to help the users to get up to speed. Eventually they'll will transition to um, user operated vehicles but I think early on for government as well as for private sector users we will have to uh, have a services contract for the first couple of years. Yes, sir. What do you think is the range of your seven-foot vehicle? The seven-foot vehicle is designed to go about seven and a half miles. And th so that's not all rocket. So you launch out to probably uh, half a mile, and then you'll have to fly the rest of the way on the rotor. How about the noise level? The noise level at takeoff, I've not done a decibel study, so I really can't tell you. I can't imagine it would be more than 80 or 100 at, at 100 feet. How about landing? You know landing is an uh, electric motor, so that's going to be your stand, a large multi-copter, about the same as a DJI Inspire. So for your um, uh, usable launch vehicle recovery, Yes. so I assume you're talking something like first stage or second stage recovery? So you're, it doesn't stage, so... No, but you're talking... Are you, so you're not talking about using this then to recover uh, first stage or second stage and then... So from a traditional rocket yeah. going up, yeah. you want to recover the first stage. This, the whole vehicle, nothing falls off. There's no okay. staging. So the vehicle takes off, it gets to apogee, or depending on the trajectory, gets downrange some, uh, a few, uh, uh, probably about half a mile under power. 
and then the engines or the uh, rotors deploy. We'll have to make sure there's a speed limit. That, that'll be operational stuff that we'll work out in flight testing. You'll fly downrange, probably slowing down from 500 to 300 knots. You go back to vertical to do your mission, whether it's surveillance, uh, some kind of package delivery, and then you transition, like you saw in the film, back to, to horizontal to fly back to the base and land uh, on your tail. So we have a minimum footprint and we have no pieces falling off. So we, we are very um, um, fastidious about that. We don't want any sort of range safety issues with dropped objects. Anything? Thank you for your attention, for the great questions. Really appreciated the opportunity to talk to this group. It's been actually fun. So thanks, everybody.